Hi, everyone. So, uh, so today uh, uh, we're going to spend uh, spend the first half of the talk really uh, discussing Nebula itself, and then uh, and then the latter half, you know, we're gonna we're gonna actually stand up a mesh network, including a mobile device, and and just show how how easy it actually is to do with Nebula. So, um, one one thing that uh, that I'd like to do here is keep this as interactive as possible. So. Um, I've asked the moderator to, you know, interrupt me anytime there are any questions, and I'm happy to to dig in and explain those. Um, and of course, you know, I, I always have to do something different for each talk. So I actually have um, I've set up my iPad as a kind of virtual whiteboard, uh, so that you know, if we want to discuss something, we can. And and hopefully, you know, we tested this out and it it works pretty well. So you know, just as an example. Um, I can pop that up and and really dig into any of these topics that people might want more clarification on as we go. Um, so thanks for joining. Uh, who am I? I think this tweet basically says it all. So um, you know, I've been doing uh, computer stuff since I grew. I grew up in the middle of nowhere in rural Illinois, and had a computer and a modem from uh, from age I don't know whatever it was twelve. And uh, and really got started on the internet very early and doing Unix things and and um, progressed through to uh, to a job at Orbits.com that lasted eleven years, which is kind of ridiculous in this day and age. Um, did it, I've done a lot of security work and uh, and eventually ended up at Slack. And uh, so Nebula was created at Slack, starting in. It was the end of 2016, uh, but really the first code I think was in early 2017. At this point, it's been so long ago that that I sometimes forget. But yeah, um, I was pretty excited to get to work on what I thought was a pretty super advanced IRC. So here's our agenda for today. Uh, we're going to talk about the open source release, then go into a bit of history about why we created Nebula and some of the considerations that were made in the, in the process of developing Nebula. And one, one thing to keep in mind is that Nebula, while it's new as an open source project, has been around for actually quite a long time. Like I said, early 2017, we started writing this. So it's not brand new by any stretch. Um, then uh, we're going to get into uh, some more detail about writing Nebula itself and the uh, the general architecture, so why we made certain decisions about Nebula, and what uh, what the outcome of those decisions has been. Um, then we're going to do a technical. Oops, sorry. Then we're going to do a technical deep dive. So, uh, really going into to pretty uh, pretty good detail on each of the the um, bits of Nebula itself, each of the components, and talking about you know how they work and, and how to stand them up for resilient and performant uh, operation. Then I think the second half, so the, the other 45 minutes after the break will be devoted to the workshop. Um, depending on time, that there may be a bit of overlap one way or the other, but, but we'll see. But uh, especially during the workshop, I'm happy to answer any questions or you know, basically what we're gonna do is stand up an entire Nebula network in AWS from scratch. Um, obviously it's, you know, I've ansible it up ahead of time. So like it's, you know, click here and, and it should kick off, but let me know, um, let me know if there are any areas you want to dig into. You can actually, you know, start thinking about that now and, and be ready with questions during the workshop. And then obviously at the end, there'll be a recap on, uh, on what we've discussed. So. We open sourced Nebula in November of 2009, and at that point, it had been been running at Slack for in production for a couple of years, maybe three years. Again, the timelines escape me, but um, you know, we we weren't sure what people were going to think of Nebula. We were we knew we were interested in it, but we weren't sure if the general uh, the general open source community would be as interested in this and especially coming at it from the infrastructure angle, you know, it, it can be hard to understand why Nebula is useful for networks of any size. But I think I think today we'll dig into uh, just how useful it can be. So we 
this is this is the tweet from uh, the day we released it on the Slack engineering blog. You can I don't have a direct link, uh, but because they're they're super long medium style links with a bunch of funny characters. So just go check out the Slack engineering blog, and uh, and you can read about you can read the the initial release information. So it was it's about a five minute read. Uh, it's a it's a quick read, but it gives a lot of background on Nebula itself and and sort of how we came at the problem of networking. Uh, also, this was this was such a lucky coincidence, but we released Nebula on November 19th to the public. And then I think it was about three days later, I had an inbound email from the folks at Linux Unplugged. And they happened to be doing a podcast on uh, mesh networks or, or you know, sort of, um, it basically exactly what Nebula was. And they had this episode planned, you know, before even hearing about Nebula. So on short notice, they reached out and, and, and we recorded a segment and I can't say enough, you know, good about, about that podcast because, uh, they, you know, they, they dug into Nebula, they, they understood it well, and they asked very relevant questions. And so this, this podcast is, is well worth a listen. One, one side note on the podcast itself is one of my favorite projects before using Nebula is called Tink, T-I-N-C. And I actually get to hear the author of Tink speak. So we, we actually both appear on that podcast and, you know, it, it also goes into more detail and probably some things I'll forget to cover here. So definitely check it out, uh, linuxunplugged.com slash 329. Uh, Jim Salter, who uh, coincidentally is the person who reached out and said, "Hey, you should you should speak at the All Things Open conference. It's it's a great one." So I, um, you know, I was happy that he he reached out and let me know. He's actually written a few articles on Nebula, and then uh, Jupiter Broadcasting, which does Linux Unplugged, also did an episode of TechSnap that was devoted to Nebula. So that's that's a more of a technical discussion of Nebula and and some of uh, Jim and Wes's experience using it. So check out Jim on Twitter. He writes for Ars Technica and uh, and he's great. So the open source reliefs uh, and the uh, the mobile apps plus defined. So just uh, I've lost track of time at this point is that last week um, on on October 8th, we finally announced that we've uh, we've released the mobile apps. So we spent we spent a good amount of time actually working on them. We we started with prototypes at the end of last year, but they were they were very much prototypes. And then starting in January or February this year, we we really started uh, messing with that code. Actually, it was in February, and we saw that we could get really good performance on iOS and Android, and so instead of rushing the release as, as kind of a beta and, and letting it, you know, letting, letting the users feel the pain of, of our programming mistakes, we, we actually used it for a period of, of many months and sort of, sort of developed it internally and then shared it with the Nebula OSS community via the Nebula OSS Slack. Uh, you can find a link to that on our GitHub page. And I think the result of that was we've, we've really created a, very uh, very polished for an early version mobile app. And uh, we're gonna show that off today as well. So when we stand up the mesh, I'm actually going to, to also stand up the mobile app on, I haven't decided yet, iPod, iPad or iPhone, but, but one of those devices. So a bit of history about, about why, we, why we made Nebula, I think is, is useful and, and gives some context on things. Um, and it starts with why I hate VPNs. Uh, and, and as a side note, if you go read the slack.engineering blog post, um, you'll notice that VPN, I, I think I have this right. I don't think VPN has, is said once. And I, I avoided saying VPN at all costs because, well, a couple of reasons. One, the term is overloaded now. So people, you know, people think VPN, historically it was how you connected to something like a corporate network, right? But uh, more recently, I think the the popularity of these sort of anonymizing type services or things that allow you to watch Netflix in another country have kind of have kind of really overloaded the term. And so 
Um, that's not why I hate VPNs, but but you know it's a reason that that calling something a VPN can be confusing right out of the gate. So uh, this very artistic rendition of, um, of why I hate VPNs gets to kind of the point, and I'm gonna try the virtual whiteboard version of this because I have my iPad all queued up here. So let me see if I can present that. Oh, hey, while we're in here, that's my co-founder, Nate. Um, he, uh, he looks just like that in person. Well, let me take these away. So there you go. There's Nate. He's he's fantastic. Um, but I had to had to draw some funny stuff on him. All right. So let's go to uh, why I hate VPNs. So I moved from here. Oops. Undo. There we go. I moved from here to here in 2006, and I was still working for a company based in Chicago at the time. And one of the things that sucks about VPNs, if, you, if you've if you been in this situation is, um, if I wanted to say, so Barcelona, great town, I, I used to love to go there. And, uh, you know, before COVID. Uh, and so what, what would happen is if I connected to my VPN back in the US and went to say a website that was hosted in Barcelona, maybe I wanted to, to rent out a vacation property, something like that. Um, you can see in this in this visual that like my traffic had to go back here to the U.S., then to the website, you know, assuming it was actually hosted there, and then back to the U.S. and then back to here, right? And the the problem with that is that's a lot of added latency. Like that that makes the experience of using the internet pretty terrible. Um, also, by the way, I just realized there's there's a technical. Or sorry, there's a there's a is it acronistic? There's a flaw with this, which is I don't think that existed yet. So we'll just pretend that iPhones existed, but I don't think they actually did yet. Um, but yeah, so so using VPNs this way kind of sucked. And um, switch back to here. So then I found out about Tink, and that's as I mentioned. Uh, it, his name is actually Hoos, I believe it's it's pronounced, but uh, he wrote uh, Tink starting in the late 90s, I want to say 1998 or 99. And what I love about Tink is, I mean, it was very early in this, but it allowed you to do really intelligent stuff with routing and standing up a mesh network before really anyone was talking about this, which was pretty amazing. And so let me show you what that looks like here. So that one is right here. So in, in something like Tink, um, instead, of, instead of routing all over the place to, to connect to different computers, what you can do is have, have things route to other things and, and even route via other nodes. So in this example, you know, my laptop here, uh, it, it might be connecting to um, this server, right, this laptop. And if they don't have a direct connection, which in this case, you know, I, there's not one, right, there's nothing there. Um, Tink is intelligent enough to actually route that, and it could it can actually take multiple hops and do something like that. So Tink is Tink is pretty great. It actually what is it? It uses uh, I'm going to get this wrong. Some kind of tree algorithm to determine how to reach the other nodes, but it's it's really smartly written. Um, and so I I think that Tink has informed a lot of the development process of Nebula over time. Um, and I'm, I'm just grateful that it was written. I think it was a, a wonderful open source, or is a wonderful open source project. So that's why I hate VPNs, but a bit of history about why Slack hated VPNs. And hated might be a strong word, but you know, it, Slack had, uh, had some bad experiences with VPNs, some of which were self, self-inflicted, but um, this is, <laughs> so, this is this is sort of what Slack started to look like over time. So, you know, a lot of people will be familiar with this kind of layout where you have uh, you have uh, oops, can't do that. All right, so you have like everything over here in US East One, the Amazon region, and then you start expanding to pops around the globe. And the reason you do that is uh, to get you know to put to put pops closer to your users. So, uh, in this example here. You can see like somebody using an iPhone in this case in Italy-ish 
um, you know, they could connect straight to, to US East one over the internet, but it tends to be faster for them to connect to a local pop and then, and the green lines, you know, signify this, use a local pop to connect uh, back to uh, US East one over Amazon's backbone. It just tends to be more performant. Um, you know, they, they, um, they have, you know, internal SLAs about network availability and, and latency and all that. So if you can, you want to terminate your users connections as close to them as possible and then transit the traffic yourself. So here's what it looked like when we, uh, when we stood up IPsec at Slack. And I'm actually going to go back and, and draw on this, this version of it again. So um, what we had was, so this is, this is like the uh, EU West 2, I believe, pop right here. And what we wanted to do is connect all of these sort of message servers and everything in Europe uh, back to the US. And the way we ended up doing that was initially IPsec. So uh, these, these IPsec boxes here, those are actual EC2 instances that are forwarding traffic across. Now, today there's, there's something called uh, cross-region peering. It didn't, it didn't exist back when we started this, so it wasn't an option. Um, but we're gonna go into why, you know, it's not a, it's not a complete solution to Slack's, Slack's needs uh, even today. So, you know, Slack was using IPsec and initially it worked pretty well, but um, as these pops grew, right, as you add more of these servers, um, you also had to add more IPsec hosts. And because of how you had to do routing, you had these weird things, you had asynchronous routing paths. And so basically it meant like this host, this host to talk to this host went through maybe, you know, this, this box here to get to, to get to that one, to get to that one, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty messy. And so um, the issue with that and the, the joke I used to make about that was it, it basically turned our network into a RAID zero network configuration. And what I mean by that is um, as you expand this and it just kept getting bigger, I think at one point we had like 50 of, of these IP secos, right? As we, as we built it out, um, what that meant was anytime you lost one of these hosts, you lost routing to an unknowable number of other hosts. And so the problem with that is um, there's no real way to plan for it. And basically, if we lost one box, just one box on, on this side here or this side here, we had to offline that entire region, right? We had to migrate millions of active users to a different region. And that that's not a great user experience. <laughs> so um, so we quickly started started looking for alternatives to this. And uh, um, so we, uh, oh yeah, and there's one other thing that, that was a limitation here. So as we built this out, let's see if I can show this more clearly. All right, so I'm gonna do a quick thing on, on security groups. So um, imagine this is all in US East one and you have some web servers and they wanna to talk to MySQL servers. There's this nice thing, nice thing called security groups where you can say anything that's called dub, 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 um, anything called dub, 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 um, you can create a rule that says it can talk to anything in the group MySQL. And this is a logic logical grouping. So you don't have to care what the IP addresses of any of these boxes are, right? It doesn't matter for this. Um, those logical groupings are great. You, you, tend to, you tend to depend on them over time and, and really stop caring about IPs, which is the way it should be, right? Um, you, should, you shouldn't treat servers as, as prized possessions, especially when you have tens of thousands of them. And so uh, the issue comes in when you go across regions. So as soon as we added another region, and in this example, I'm just that we had more than one other region, but um, say you want to now talk from US East one to EU West two, right? Um, and now you want to use your nice dub 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 group and allow it to talk to your MySQL group. Well, you can't. Uh, you, that doesn't exist, right? So uh, once you once you cross regions, and this still to this day is true even with VPC peering. Once you cross regions, you're now dealing with IP addresses again. Um, 
which sucks because unless you've you know set up all kinds of subnetting ahead of time, you probably weren't thinking about when you initially stood up your environment. And so um, it makes it makes segmentation of a network extremely difficult, uh, especially as as you're expanding. So there's those again. Uh, so what about IPsec in transport mode is uh, is something that that people will have asked. Well, um, one fun anecdote there we brought. So we we didn't start off wanting to write software to solve this problem, right? We we had we were the security. So the people interested in this were the the ops and security teams, and myself and Nate, who initially started on Nebula, we were in the, in the security department. So you know this wasn't exactly a problem we were looking to solve, especially not not spend a bunch of time writing software. And uh, so we we actually brought in vendors to to discuss. Uh, options that that existed, and um, one of the vendors we brought in said, "Oh, you know, we can do IPsec in transport mode." Which uh, the difference is. So, if you remember, let's see. Let me pull this up again. There we go. Apologies on one sec. That one. All right, so. If you remember this uh, this document, so the difference is in this one you have these IPsec nodes that are separate EC2 instances. In transport mode, you can do um, you can have these boxes. You can basically eliminate those. And the difference is you don't encrypt the IP headers anymore. You just encrypt the payload. But it allows you know this box to talk straight to that box, right? Which is which is an improvement over over the RAID zero network configuration. Um, but you know during the discussion with this vendor. They they brought up a very important question, which is what is your fan out? So, you know what that means is how many um, how many of your web server or sorry how many database servers will one of your web servers talk to? And we said thousands, right? Like one web server because of how we did did sharding, one web server might talk to every database over the course of a minute. And <laughs> um, obviously, won't name the vendor, but they they basically said don't use our product right like they said once you get to that kind of fan out you're not going to have a good experience and so um so ipsec in transport mode really didn't fit our needs because we were already you know 10,000 hosts something like that the other issue is ipsec even in transport mode doesn't solve security groups so even if we used ipsec we're just we actually if we'd used ipsec today we probably would just be using cross region peering because it, it's a much better version of, of the same thing we were trying to achieve, but they both lack security groups for, for good network segmentation and isolation. Um, another common question, why didn't we use WireGuard? Um, basically, it, it boils down to kind of the same thing. So a couple of reasons. Back in 2016, I think WireGuard's website even said like, this is early stuff. I, I don't know how early it was, but it kind of said right on the wet main website, don't use this in production. So we didn't use it in production. Um, WireGuard's great. Like I have a lot of good things to say about it. WireGuard is is concerned with being a VPN, not with being sort of this this mesh network, right? So, um, if we had if we'd used something like WireGuard, we we knew that we would have to preload the keys on every device in our network ahead of time to allow any particular pair to communicate with each other. So, um, WireGuard has a really great architecture but at the scale we were trying to run um, we had this problem where you had to inform n minus one nodes of any new node that was joining before they could talk to each other right and so once you get to 10,000 nodes you know you it, it's a solvable problem but now you're talking about a lot of overhead traffic uh, just to inform nodes about each other. And then you have to deal with things like offline nodes and, and uh, um, you know, kind of keeping state and bringing them up to date when they come back. So like, I think WireGuard's great. It just wasn't, wasn't what we needed. And on top of it, you know, it didn't have the, the security group functionality that was kind of a core piece of why we, why we wanted to uh, build Nebula. Um, zero tier, we didn't really know about. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say like briefly, the, the main issue, the reason we probably still wouldn't have used zero tier, and, and again, it's a really cool project, but um, 
until very recently, you couldn't host your own discovery servers. So zero tier is similar to Nebula in some ways, but basically they host the network discovery. You can think of it as DNS effectively, like how does a node reach another node? And you know, it was hard enough to convince Slack to use something like Nebula that we, we owned all of the infrastructure for. Um, I can't imagine convincing the operations team to trust the network availability for you know all of Slack to a third party. I that's not to say that you know I there's anything bad about them. I don't know them, but that that was part of the issue is I don't know enough about them. And um, and on top of it, like they have a version of filtering, but it wasn't exactly what we were looking for. And so you know I and and the the real answer is we didn't know about zero tier until. Uh, probably a year into writing Nebula. So that's the simpler answer, but there's a reason we still probably wouldn't have used it. Um, what about insert whatever? Um, so there are some other projects that do things like key distribution, but you know, it, it's still that N minus one problem. Like we wanted something that was, um, that was able to provide just in time connectivity without having to share a bunch of data around. Like, any, any two nodes should be able to connect without knowing anything about each other ahead of time. And you know we did that via a root of trust. So um, I'm gonna take a quick pause here and just ask if anyone has any questions on, on any of that content before I move on to the next section. And I'm just now pulling up the chat. So let me see if I... Okay. All right, so let's move on. So- Hi, you know, it does look like we have oh, yeah. one question from Bruno. Oh, okay. Great. Okay, so can you go, a so can you see that question? Um, I'm trying to find it in the interface, honestly. Oh, there you go, chat, I see it now. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Yeah, so what about, so uh, Bruno's asking, what about mesh services that are that are popping up now, like Istio, Linkerd, um, and etcd? Um, they're kind of solving a different problem than, than what we were going for here. So, you know, they, they often provide transit, uh, capability, like a good example, Slack uses Envoy, right? But at least back when we started on this, um, Envoy's docs said, uh, if you wanna connect things across, uh, across the internet, uh, you should probably use mutual TLS. And that was kind of the extent of it. It was like, okay, go figure out mutual TLS. And, and that was, you know, it, people treat mutual TLS as though it is a, uh, an easily solvable, obvious, you know, obvious solution. And it's really not like running your own PKI and, and doing this. Um, people that work at Google will say like, oh, it's super easy. You know, we just, we just use uh, ALTS everywhere and everything is authenticated, everything. But um, there are a lot of reasons we couldn't do it there. One of the, one of the big ones was we were transiting UDP traffic as well. So like, that's a whole other can of worms that, that we didn't solve. But what Nebula doesn't try to be is, um, is any kind of, uh, load balancer or synchronization service, it's it's more concerned with providing the raw connectivity. And so um, I think those mesh, mesh services over Nebula actually makes a lot of sense um, using Nebula as the, the connectivity layer for other things. So cool, thank you for the question. So, um, so I guess we're gonna write some software. So we started in 2006-ish. Again, I, I asked Nate about this just a bit ago and he couldn't remember for sure either. I do, I do know that, you know, we were just chatting, we were, we were out walking around and the moment we decided to really write Nebula was when we started talking about encapsulating security groups and Nebula certificates. Like that was the killer feature that, that just convinced us that this was worth doing. Um, we did it in Go, right? So Nebula is written in Golang. And a lot of people have asked, like, why didn't you use Rust? Why didn't you use, you know, whatever? Like, we didn't use C and C++ because 
memory safety, right? Bumper, like Golang is, it's it's much harder to write things with buffer overflows and, and simple exploitable stuff. Um, and we, we were gonna be dealing with, with a lot of uh, network traffic. So we didn't wanna expose our code to the internet without having decent memory safety. Uh, the reason we used Go honestly was because we knew that we could probably find more developers who would know how to write Go than, than some of the other alternatives. So that may not be true long-term, but, but that helped. And, and one thing Go, I think, doesn't get enough credit for is the fact that you can, if you, if you optimize how you write Go, you can start to remove the garbage collector from relevance. So Go allowed us to prototype things very quickly. And then when we needed a more performant version to swap it out, right? So Go was, Go was a choice that we made you know, pretty, pretty early on, uh, we'd written some other things in it. And uh, if I had it to do over again, I think we would have made the same decision. A um, little bit of funny history, uh, early versions of Nebula had <laughs> distributed hash tables. So when we were thinking about the problems of how to discover nodes, you know, we had this, what it, wouldn't it be cool if there was no central source of truth? Like what if they could talk amongst themselves and figure it out? Um, there was DHT code in the code base for a while. I experimented with that for better than a month, if I remember right. Uh, let's just say it didn't go well. Um, probably a lot of that is me not understanding it well enough. But but also like you know, I think the solution we came to was was actually much better than than sort of the direction we were headed. Um, we actually the open source version of Nebula doesn't doesn't reflect this because we cut the history when we when we put it out in public, but we actually threw way more code than than is actually in the Nebula repo today. Like there was there were so many experiments that in Nebula. Um, but one of the early bits of code is actually almost unchanged from its early iteration. So the uh, the firewall code actually came first. Before we went down the, the this path, Nate, who's who's amazing at performance uh, tuning and, and just programming in general, he wanted to make sure that that our internal firewall could be fast enough to do this if it was written in Go. So the so before we even wrote any of the transport layer, the firewall code was was created. Um, you know, we we knew that it had to scale. Uh, so this was this was kind of a unique advantage. Like if I, if I had wanted to create something like Nebula. But wasn't working at Slack. I think we would have made different decisions. And facing the prospect of releasing this internally at Slack to, uh, you know, to a very large infrastructure right away meant we had to had to think about how to do that um, and maintain, you know, uptime and, and all the important stuff. Um, so at Slack, uh, this actually involved orchestration via Chef and and a direct fault integration. So at Slack nodes can can authenticate to vault with their nebula credentials which you know I, I if you i don't want to go down this rabbit hole too far but if you've used vault that's a very nice property to have like the the way it works at slack is you chef a new box it has a provisional cert that provisional nebula cert can only talk to the provisioner instance and the lighthouses and then uh once once it uh, asks for a cert from that that uh, that CA, basically, the CA uses AWS's backend to verify that it is actually one of the nodes that we trust before giving it. So there's there's a sort of three leg you know, authentication process that goes on behind the scenes. Um, that's not open sourced yet. It it is unlikely to be because it was it was quite custom. So we open sourced the parts of Nebula that you know were less custom to Slack's use. Um, but I think there's a need here, and that's sort of what we're working on at the new company, right? Is how to how to deploy this at scale if you're not Slack. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that section. There's probably not a lot of lot of questions out of that one, so I'm just going to carry on. So um, this is a bit about uh, oh yeah, how I learned to stop worrying and love UDP, the the technical deep dive here. So. The, the first thing to know is we used something called the noise protocol framework. Uh, we, this, is, this is instead of using something like TLS or in the case of UDP, DTLS, uh, datagram TLS. The reason we did that was there's just so much uh, sort of legacy cruft at this point in, you know, TLS 1.3, I don't think was really 
out out there yet. But but in TLS 1.2 and prior, there's a lot of cruft. There's, you know, X509 has its issues. Um, handshakes can be multiple round trips. Noise, the noise protocol framework has some really nice properties where, and, and we use one of these, which is a uh, single round trip handshake. So to, to complete a nebula handshake, it's one packet out from the initiating host, one packet back, and now, now you've stood up a tunnel. And in TLS, you know, that can be, that can be three round trips, I think, in, in kind of the common case. So the Nebula certificate format is not X509, it's protobufs. You know, some people would say, well, why didn't you just use X509? We did, uh, we actually used an early version. Uh, in an early version, Nate wrote a complete elliptic curve X509 implementation for Go, because I don't think it existed yet um, within Go. And, you know, it worked. I mean, we, we got it working, but the initial packet size was, was a bit troubling. So. A lot. The, the internet has something called the internet minimum MTU, which historically is like 576 bytes. And, you know, above that, you're not guaranteed that your packet won't fragment. And then across the internet, some routers drop fragmented packets. Like there's all kinds of stuff going on. So, so the short version of this is we wanted our handshakes to be as small as possible so that the chance they would be fragmented was, was limited. Um, X509 also, you know, if you wanted to do something like Nebula security groups, you'd have to use um, maybe custom attributes in X509 or, you know, there's a lot of ways you could do it, but that kind of eliminates the advantage of X509 because, you know, if my um, vault server doesn't understand anything about the types of X509 certs I'm generating with these custom fields, then, you know, what's the point? And so Protobuf gave us a couple of things. It gave us much smaller certificates, like I think our minimum cert size is is in the dozens of bytes, uh, and and allowed us to uh, also be a bit more expressive. And and so we used protobufs, like we just we just encrypt protobufs to uh, to do the certificates in Nebula. Um, security groups are a first class part of it, so they're they're encoded right in the cert and enforced by each node individually. There's no central source of truth for security groups, which which was important. And the lighthouse architecture is also uh, pretty interesting. Uh, you know, we took a pretty interesting path to the to doing the lighthouse the way we did it. Early on, I was doing stuff, just playing around with console uh, in early versions of the lighthouse, and we, you know, I was I was getting everything synced up and and like, okay, cool, we can have this shared set of hosts and you know whatever. But um, I'd already seen you know folks discuss issues they've had with with you know console. I, I'm sure that it can be run reliably, but I'd already seen reports of it, you know, having hiccups here and there. And we needed this to be highly available. So we just didn't want to chance it. And so um, what, we, what we ended up doing was set, saying, why deal with eventual consistency, these sort of raft style things, when you can have uh, perpetual inconsistency? So at Slack, there are something like six lighthouses. I don't know if that's still accurate, um, but they're, they're globally distributed. They don't actually know about each other, right? So each node uh, reports itself to every, every lighthouse independently. And also when it wants to reach another node, it queries them all independently and it aggregates the results itself. Uh, there's other limitations like a lighthouse can't give more than 10 answers. So it's hard to DDoS answers. But basically this all means the, that the, uh, the lighthouses are not, it are explicitly not trusted. Like a compromised lighthouse can't, compel a host to talk to another host. It can't even compel a host to stop talking to another host. It can give bad answers. But in the case of something like six lighthouses, you know, as long as one of them is, is functioning, the network just continues to work. Um, and so, you know, that's one thing that we've worked hard to avoid is trusting the lighthouse with any of this. When we start talking about things like, uh, like uh, uh, blacklisting, people often say like, well, the lighthouses could do it. But but there are reasons we, we really want to avoid that. Um, so we used AES. Uh, noise lets you use AES or ChaCha -Cha Poly as, as the encryption. So um, it's AES GCM and then ChaCha -Cha Poly is actually what WireGuard uses. The, the important difference here, the only thing to really know is um, if you have AES NI instructions, which most Intel CPUs do these days, then AES sometimes is, is generally a bit faster. But if you have devices that don't, which the majority of, of mobile phones don't have, you know, sort of AES and I acceleration, then ChaCha -Cha Poly is actually 
a superior choice. So we have to, we support both, uh, but you have to choose network wide. Hey, Ryan, and, just wanted to yeah. let you know you have five more minutes left for this first one. Cool. Um, we're, we're right on schedule. Thank you. Um, so uh, the so as an example, Slack Slack runs it in AES mode, and the reason they do that is this is mostly servers talking to other servers that have that acceleration. My home network, I have a bunch of Raspberry Pis, I have mobile devices, I run it in Cha Cha Poly mode. Um, the the performance you sacrifice by using Cha Cha Poly on Intel devices is is pretty negligible at this point. But if you have something like an older Atom CPU that maybe has ASNI, there's still a bit of an advantage. So it's worth supporting both. But, but again, you can't run in mixed mode. So you have to decide for each Nebula network which way you run um, because there's no uh, what's called crypto agility. And it's, it's, you can go read about crypto agility and why it, it has been a headache um, for, for the internet uh, for many, many years. Uh, we do something called hole punching, which I don't know if I'll have uh, too much time to explain. But here's here's the here's the I made all these uh, these images myself, so that's why they don't look that cool. But basically, the way hole punching works is you have these uh, these two firewalls, and say change this. So say this laptop wants to talk to um, say this laptop wants to talk to this server. Um, the way it does it, say I have a normal firewall, I hit that firewall. And then let me do some, nope, that one. Uh, when, I, when I actually make an outbound connection, a UDP connection, it goes like this. And now anything that comes back this direction from, from these hosts will go into that firewall, no problem. Like that's the, the root of, of how hole punching works. But when I send that packet, this firewall, this one here doesn't know anything about me, right? And so um, let me clear that out. So, you know, so I've sent this, great. Um, let me move that up. Sorry, bear with me. Um, so I've sent that out, but this one, this one, it just hits this firewall and doesn't go anywhere. What UDP hole punching does is, in our case, we use, uh, we use the lighthouses to do this. Uh, that one? Nope. Oh, get back. Apologies, it was this one. Oh yeah, the one that I drew grass on. Great. So, um, so in this case, if we want to do hole punching, what we do is, oop, there we go. We send, we send actually, uh, we actually connect to this lighthouse, and this lighthouse can help us discover the the right port combination that will allow us to talk to these nodes. And what'll happen is, you know, we make this outbound connection. One of these packets is still going to fail. But then the, via the lighthouse, a, a signal will reach this node saying, hey, you need to actually go this direction and open the equivalent hole the other, direct, the other, the other way. And so, um, so what ends up happening is via this, this third party here, the lighthouse, you can actually signal out. And even if you don't change any of these firewall configs, you can have these two boxes talk directly to each other. So hole punching is, it's like a whole exercise in, um, in working around limitations of NAT, but it's it's pretty interesting. Um, cool. So, wow, uh, one minute remaining in the first section before we go to the workshop. So pretty on time here. Um, here I'm going to pull up this picture of Nate again, so we can look at that while we while we hang out. Um, I'm sure he'll love that when he sees this later. And uh, yeah, does anyone have any other quick questions before we take the 15 minute break? And just so you know, when we come back, so we're actually going to be sort of in a terminal looking at AWS and we're going to stand up a, a Nebula network and then uh, also connect a mobile device to it and just sort of step through that. So, um, you know, we'll be back in uh, in about 15 minutes and I'll, uh, I'll turn it back over to the moderator and let me know if there are any questions uh, that come up. I'll still have my headphones in. All right. So um, with that, we're going to dig into the workshop a bit. And a lot of this is going to take place in, um, well, not much of it will take place in the EC2 console, thankfully, uh, but a lot of it will take place in a terminal. And uh, I'm actually going to start off. So this this AWS account is just a this just a test one. 
And uh, you can see I've actually terminated some instances. So I'm filtering out uh, to just show the running instances right now and that there are none uh, in use in this region. And what I'm gonna do is actually just kick off, uh, kick off this Ansible job that uh, I'll let go in the background here. And we should see some, some instances pop up. Oh, I might've left it at six. Well, that's fine. Um, luckily we have a little VC money to pay these bills now. Uh, yeah, I think I'm launching six of them, um, but we're just launching uh, some C5 2X larges in AWS uh, so that we can show this off. And what's gonna happen here is it's gonna launch uh, six fresh nodes and it's just going to randomly choose one to make the lighthouse. So this, this Ansible script I wrote is actually uh, a benchmarking kind of tool, but it's, it's useful because it'll stand up the network. And then what we can do from there is kind of show what Nebula looks like, show some of the features of Nebula. And also we're gonna connect a mobile device to, to this infrastructure. So um, if I refresh this now, yep, I started, oh, they're four, oh good. Those are more expensive. We've started C5 4X larges. So uh, cool, I'll talk fast so we can, we can stop these quickly. Um, let's see, so, um, so one, one funny side note, like there are all these anecdotes about running Nebula. Um, one of the, one of the funny things that happened recently is somebody showed up in, I think it was the Slack. It might've been, it might have been a GitHub post, but somebody, somebody casually mentioned that, Hey, we're running, like they had a, they had an issue, but they're like, Hey, but, but on the thousands of nodes where we're running Nebula, it's working fine. And, you know, it's always, it's always great to hear from folks who are, already using it at scale because I've told people we, when we created this, we knew we were super into it, but we didn't know if anyone else would care. And so it's been really nice uh, to see the, the community adoption. And I think we're, I think we've crossed the threshold. We're at 6,000 GitHub stars in uh, just a, just a bit under a year, which, which is great. I mean, it's a, it's solving, you know, problems that people actually have. And, and I use it personally every day. Uh, it's, it's how I run my, my entire personal network. And one of the nice things about Nebula is, um, you know, you, you stop caring about what IP a device has anywhere in the world. So I like to call it, you know, sort of location agnostic connectivity. Like I have 3D printers here in the house. Um, I have things at my office. I have uh, things back, you know, where I'm from at my, at my mom's place. And all of those things are on one seamless network. And what's, what's funny about it is, once you get used to Nebula, you actually forget where some of your devices are. Like I've actually, I've had this happen where more than once I've had to, you know, go back and look up, uh, like, like do a, an IP lookup, like, you know, have a box curl, what is my IP or one of those, uh, just so I know where it is, because um, you, you really start to forget that when you get the, the nice connectivity that, that Nebula brings. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to randomly pick one of these hosts and we'll see if I can SSH in. Uh, yeah, it should be at the point where I can. Um, it's installing a good number of tools. Oh, cool. My user's already created. Um, so I'm starting tmux into tmux. Exhibit would be very happy about this. And then I have a, I have a tmux file set up so I can just do a hotkey here. And it's going to launch a bunch of windows with a bunch of information. And let's see. I don't have a Nebula IP quite yet. So that's the last step in here. But oh, we're copying the Nebula certs and binaries. And again, this, um, this, this is six nodes. But if I change one variable in this Ansible script, it could be 100, right? Like it, it really doesn't matter. And because of that just-in-time provisioning, I can just add, I could go back and add, you know, 50 more nodes and not tell these initial nodes anything about them. And, and still they'll, they'll discover each other via the lighthouses and they'll have connectivity. So uh, just to give you a little tour of what we're looking at here. Um, so HTOP, just to look at, at, you know, sort of CPU and memory, uh, we have, uh, IF top, which is just so we can see packet flows right under there. Um, let me see EQ. So number number two is 
uh, is HTOP, three is IFTOP. Uh, at the bottom is just the Nebula log output. Um, I find it funny that one of the ways to follow logs, I, this is the syntax I know, uh, is dash fu nebula, um, which I don't know, I chuckle every time I type that. Uh, but like, that's what's, that's what's down here is just uh, the, the Nebula log file so that I can show you some things in regards to Nebula and yep, and we're all done. So um, here, cool. So we have a, actually a bunch of interfaces stood up. Uh, if, you, if you hadn't noticed there were only a, a couple at the start, uh, you may recognize what some of those are. But off the bat, um, so one of the things that that you know I think is is really important to know about about Nebula is it's designed for use in a DevOps environment where maybe you know so e each host has a lot of tunnels and maybe you don't want to restart the the tunnels every time you uh, you make a change to something like the firewall right so um, let's see Nebula config so this is where the config lives for this particular host and. Yeah, you can go ahead and steal the private key. Um, that's fine. Uh, if you if you get there in the next 40, 32 minutes, uh, more power to you. Um, so let me go through this. So down at the bottom here is the simple firewall config I have set up on this box. So you know we we actually can filter based on a number of a number of uh, certificate identifiers for each host. Like you can do uh, this one is host. Um, you might recognize 5201 as the iperf. We just allow anything on this Nebula network to connect to, connect to it. And then in this group, um, one one example I like to to show people is with something like like uh, SSH. If you want to prevent lateral uh, movement within a network, what you can do is just give your bastions a group like uh, Bastion, and only allow them to SSH to things. Right? Like that's a that's a pretty powerful construct. And one thing that I, I'd love to see in the in the future is people actually alerting on uh, Nebula firewall misses. Like, you know, generally you won't like generally you ignore your firewall logs because they're just riddled with nonsense. But to actually tr attempt an SSH connection on a Nebula network, you have to be authenticated. So the signal value is actually very high uh, for things like why is this box connecting to a thousand ports that that it doesn't have access to, like. You know, you'd never put that rule in an, in any kind of alerting pipeline for a host that's just on the internet. But on a on a Nebula network, it's actually quite interesting. The way I like to explain it is, at at in in the non nefarious case, it's a it's a misconfiguration, and in the nefarious case, like it might be somebody that is now accessing one of your hosts, and and you'd like to know about that. Um, so let me show you what a Nebula certificate looks like. Uh, See, temp, is that where I put them? Yeah, Nebula. So there's there's two main there's two uh, binaries. If you build Nebula, I think I've like here. I'll just make it for every platform. Um, so make all. So you know, that's one other nice thing, by the way, about using Go is you can just compile it for all these platforms, including MIPS. It runs on my Ubiquity router somehow. Um, not fast, but it it does work. Um, so, you know, you have Nebula and Nebula Cert, and Nebula Cert, you can do introspection like uh, is there print dash path define net root dot ca dot. There you go. Um, so that's that's actually what the protobuf uh, shows for this one. So uh, the name isn't very good. Uh, it expires in over a hundred years. So that's Probably don't do that, but hey, this is this is okay. Um, and then you can see that this is a, a CA certificate, so that means this certificate can be used to sign other certificates. Uh, and then you have some some fingerprints. One other thing to know about uh, those firewall rules is you can actually bind to a CA. So uh, don't want to spend too much time on this, but what it means is like you can have multiple routes in your in your trusted CA list, and then you can have different firewall rules based on which CA uh, somebody's certificate belongs to, which is which is also quite powerful. Um, so, yeah. So let me pick another host here, and 
Let's see. Of course, I cleared my screen because I do that way too often. And we'll go back here and SH that one. Uh, Tmox that. All right. Which one is this? This is 3.5. And this is, oh, wow. All right, so I am on the on the lighthouse. And so um, what I'm gonna do here is just demonstrate what it looks like to use the security group. So I'm gonna do install telnet, that'll be funny. Uh, dash L, I'm just setting up dash L dash P, I don't know, eight, one, two, two. No, of course I didn't. There we go, all right. So I'm just setting up a normal uh, TCP listener on this host. I don't remember what my Nebula rules are, so this may just work. Um, and what I'm gonna do is telnet to uh, 100.64.0. And by the way, you can pick whatever address scheme you want for Nebula. 64.5 on port 8122. All right, so there we go. Yeah, so I did allow it, right? So I have this port open. Oops, I didn't mean to. What do I do about that? Well, in Nebula, all of the rules are enforced on the receiver side. So on this host, what I'll do is go into Etsy uh, Nebula oops, config .yaml, and there's probably yeah there's so there's so don't do this by the way. Like this is this is kind of the, the cautionary tale. Anything in my Nebula network can talk to anything else. That's obviously one way you can run it, but but I really do recommend uh, trying to segment when possible. So what we're going to do is just get rid of this rule um, that allows everything to talk to everything, and instead of uh, restarting Nebula, which you know you might be inclined to do, um, let's look for the Nebula process. All right. It is one, two, three, four, six. Just missed. All right, so sudo kill dash hop. And by the way, we should see that reflected down here, I believe. Uh, one, two, three, four, six. Yep, there you go. So uh, what happened there is I didn't even kill any of the existing tunnels. And this has reloaded its firewall config, um, refreshed its certificate in case a new one popped up, uh, all without starting the pro or without restarting the process, it, especially in a production environment, that's really handy. And so now, you can see, all right, cool. I can't connect to it anymore, right? Um, if you TCP dump the Nebula interface, you won't even see the, the traffic attempting to come in because it's it's happening at the Nebula layer. So the, the traffic is just no longer allowed. And again, you know, that's one of the differences that Nebula has versus uh, sort of traditional VPNs is we we do all of the firewall stuff internally. Uh, most most sort of VPN solutions don't don't do that. Some do. Uh, but we we really felt like the the performance we were getting out of this was was more than sufficient, and we're we're really happy with the implementation. And let me just do um, C one or two. So this is the classic iperf test, and I'm going to do oh, let's do iperf three actually. And I, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you something about iperf uh, that that I think leads people astray a bit when they're thinking about uh, sort of performance, right? Um, a lot of people will go hop on a box, run iperf and say, oh, well, that's how fast something is. But, but it, it can hide some of the underlying reasons in, in really important ways. So in this case, let me connect to this Nebula IP, uh, it was dot five, I think, um, dash T100. Oh, and I wanna point, so this is the first, this should be the first time, no, it won't be the first time those boxes are talking actually. Um, let me restart. Oops, I did it on the wrong one. Nothing like the live demo. Uh, somebody is asking which ubiquity router I have. I have the Unify Security Gateway. So just like the USG, it's it's the slowest MIP CPU. I think I get a solid 20 megabit uh, out of Nebula, um, but it is handy because I can connect back to it without knowing that IP. So yeah, I actually looked at a question um, off to the side. All right, so. Let me just restart Nebula, so service. And the reason I'm doing this is to, to get rid of the existing tunnel, because I want to show you something important here. Um, all right, so if I go back to this host, you'll see uh, closed tunnel received. 
Uh, bah, bah, bah. And they did handshake again. Oh, right, because I'm on the lighthouse. So it's reporting itself to the lighthouse all the time. Um, so that's fine. They have a handshake, but they've barely, they've exchanged only a few packets. So now let's go up here. Um, D up, D up, and that. And what I'm going to do is start an iProf test. And this is just going to send a bunch of TCP traffic to the other one. What I want you to watch here is um, this third pane. So the one that's kind of highlighted in green right now. Um, you're going to see something interesting here. And I'll explain why in a minute. Let's do, let's actually just do a short test. So that's not very fast, right? Like, you see that? Oh, wait, what's happening now? Now it's really fast. <laughs> um, and, and so blink and you would miss it. But what has happened here is Nebula started off by handshaking with, uh, let me highlight it here. Is that the one? That's not me. Yeah. So that's, that's the host that I was just uh, sending the iperf stream to. And it, it did a handshake with that and it was working fine. But what, what we actually do inside of Nebula is uh, we have a packet-based a counter that says, okay, if there's a lot of traffic going between these hosts, we should, we should ask the lighthouse like pretty regularly if there's a better path. And so that's what you can see here. So, so like up here, you'll see that, uh, you know, we were, we were going really slow, like 10 megabit, uh, just for a few seconds. And then suddenly we're going 7.3 gigabit, right? And the reason that happened is because uh, this host asked the lighthouse, hey, do you have any other answers that I could try? And it, it actually upgraded. And so instead of using this to connect, which is the routable IP, it used this to connect, which is the local IP, right? And that's when we saw this upgrade to 7.3-ish gigabit. Um, one of the other nice things is, uh, you know, you don't get a lot of packet retransmits in Nebula once you have a, a nice tunnel set up. Um, but this also leads to another question. Hey, Ryan. Why, uh, why was Nebula going so slow here? Uh, that was an interesting discovery early on. And the reason is because in this particular instance, um, we are, oh, IPA, there we go. We are running Nebula uh, with a, uh, an MTU of 8,600. Um, the reason it goes slow is because Amazon hates IP fragments. If you use a jumbo MTU and send traffic uh, across, even, even between two AWS instances, but across the internet, right? So that was, that was a routable IP that we saw before. They, they severely limit your, your bandwidth, right? Like they knock you down pretty quickly to that, that 10 megabit number. Um, and it's consistently 10 megabit. It's just part of what their software defined network does. And, and the reason for that is if you have a lot of IP fragments, those fragments take up memory on routers and like it's a vector for denial of service. So it's, it's entirely defensible for them to do it. Um, but it means that, that you have to be aware of, of your routes. And so Nebula actually allows you to set per route MTUs uh, to avoid things like that. And you, you wouldn't use it in AWS, but, but it's a useful feature if you know that like you can use jumbo MTU or jumbo frames locally but you know some remote things can't, so you can do that per route, which is which is quite handy. Um, so, so yeah, there you go. There's iperf running, and like we'll do that. Um, but here's the here's the thing about using uh, iperf. If you're using jumbo MTUs, um, you're kind of cheating, and a lot of people will benchmark things and use different MTUs. So one of the things that is the great equalizer is uh, just to do dash M100, which does, uh, I think it's MSS clamping. But basically that's now saying, um, I'm gonna send 100 byte packets, not 8,600 byte packets. And, um, and oh, I'm kind of short. So I'm short on time a little bit, but basically, you know, if you really wanna compare things, uh, I highly recommend doing iperf with packets per second. And you can see over in this side, um, I have packets per second printed every, every second for all of these different interfaces, because that's actually going to tell you way more about performance than just the raw, you know, sort of iperf number. Um, and, and the reason that matters is like, if you're doing bulk transfer, you're going to hit that, you're going to use big packets, right? Like it's probably going to be nicely optimized, but if you're doing like high interactivity stuff, 
an example would be like every keystroke you send on, send on Slack, you know, ends up as a packet over a WebSocket, right? That's a lot of small packets. And, and that's actually where you're going to hit performance limits in almost every type of networking. So again, I just want to call that out as something that you should be aware of when you're, when you're thinking about uh, performance. So here's another feature that Slack doesn't use, uh, but that, that I find quite handy for my own network, which is we have a built-in DNS server. So um, it's normally bound to port 53, but this box has something bound to it. So I set it up to, to do something else. Uh, 27 dot, and then 64.0.5. That didn't work. What am I doing wrong? Um, ba, 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 ba. I don't remember. Let's see. Live demos. I decided to do a 45 minute live demo, so this is on me. Um, dig uh, dash. No, that's right. Dash at 100.64.0.1 and then uh, 100.64.0.2. Five, and I can't talk to it because I did something wrong. Okay, well, that's no fun. Oh, you know what it might be? It might not be bound to that interface. There, no. Three, I promise I'll give up in a sec if I don't get this. Um, at, one and we'll do uh, 100. There we go. That's more useful. Okay. So this is this is one of the handy little features of Nebula. Now I remember what I did wrong. Okay. So, but basically, uh, you can turn on this DNS functionality. Slack doesn't use it at all. Um, they didn't need to. Uh, they didn't need to do DNS this way. They did, they had their own stuff already set up, but I wanted this sort of dynamic DNS functionality. So we added this where when you connect to Nebula um, to a lighthouse, the lighthouse can be a DNS server. Uh, you know, caveat here is don't like trusting lighthouses for everything. So don't use this for like super sensitive stuff unless you're, you're really trusting your lighthouses, but, but it is a handy feature. And so if you do a TXT query for, to the lighthouse. In this case, this, this 0 0.1 is the lighthouse and 0 0.5 is the IP I'm asking it about. And I did a TXT query. What I actually get back is the cert information for that node. And so what I did wrong in the first query, by the way, is I was asking it an IP address. That's not actually what this is for. If you do a non-text query, it's so that you can do this. Uh, Node5.nebula.defined.net. And there you go. And now I got that answer. And what's really cool is you can actually delegate this Lighthouse DNS server as a real on the internet DNS server if you don't mind exposing internal IP addresses. Like that's that's entirely up to you. But um, but this DNS functionality is nice, and it means that whatever name you put into a certificate uh, is is automatically kind of dynamically resolved. Um, I'm just looking at. I see a question here. Let's see. Sometimes when you kill an instance of Nebula on a working tunnel, it seems that uh, some packets locally are resumed once you once you run the instance again. Yeah. Oh, okay. So why so why does Nebula queue packets? Um, I mean, actually, you'll see that if I if I can get the mobile demo done, you'll see why. Basically, when when you try to connect to another Nebula node, what what happens is it looks up the real IP and port to use, and then it handshakes, but it'll cache the first hundred or so packets that you send to that that node. And as soon as the handshake completes, it'll actually send those through. So uh, it, it's limited to 100 just to ensure that like you can't DOS it by simply sending a bunch of outbound traffic to a, an IP that'll never handshake. But um, but it's handy because that way, you know, like your initial SSH uh, handshake is delayed, but not just dropped, even though an existing tunnel doesn't exist. So you, it'll be reflected as sort of long ping times. Um, and, and again, that's just because we hold about 100 uh, packets uh, right off the bat. And we, we expire those quickly, like we did a bunch of testing to make sure that if you don't handshake it, um, where does it store it since the instance is skilled? There's, there's not a capability to do that. So I'll, we'll, let's connect on Slack afterward because I'm curious the, the case you're seeing, um, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't hold on to packets after the fact. So I'm not, I'm not sure why, why that's happening, but happy to chat about it after. So, 
Um, one other thing. To, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I heard someone on. Okay. So uh, one other thing to note here, by the way, is uh, a lot of people will do this style of um, of PKI where you like do these certs uh, as files. You can also, we added this at, at some point where you can actually inline the certs. So this is, of course, the super confusing YAML syntax is you do space, pipe, indent. But the nice thing about this is uh, if you want to push out config files, you can actually put everything you need for Nebula in one file. Um, so I think on this host, yeah, there's only, there's only the config file. So one other thing to be aware of there. Um, unsafe routes is also uh, kind of interesting. It's what I was talking about where you can talk to non-Nebula devices, but basically what it means is you can stand up a route to, through Nebula to things that don't speak Nebula, which is also quite handy. All right, so here's the livest of live demos. Um, let me switch over to, uh, to this. Also, I learned a very valuable thing. One of my, one of my coworkers, Brian Kelly, uh, taught me that QuickTime is actually a pretty good way to, uh, to show uh, like iPads and, and iPhones. And so this is, and I put it on do not disturb um, because that wouldn't be fun. Um, so, so this is actually my, my current connection to Nebula from mobile, mobile device. And uh, I just leave this running all the time, by the way. So uh, I want to show you a couple of things in here, though. So okay. I'm going to disconnect real quick. And Ryan, it looks like we have a question. I don't know if you wanted to take that now or wait. Yeah, I'm happy to. What's the what's okay. the question? Uh, it's does Nebula support um, IPv6? And if not currently, is it on the roadmap? Uh, so it currently does not support IPv6. Um, the it, it's on the roadmap, especially because there's uh, there's someone now that uh, that works at Slack that has a keen interest in doing it because their ISP is IPv6 centric. Um, the the one thing that that we're not decided on yet is whether we're going to use whether we're going to do IPv6 for internal Nebula addressing uh, as as soon as we do it for external. So using IPv6 to negotiate Nebula tunnel like for the the layer. Uh, makes a lot of sense. It may make some sense to use IPv6 internally with Nebula, but we just haven't haven't decided yet um, because you know there 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 are pros and cons to doing it. One of the cons is um, you're you're increasing the packet size a bit. Like there, there's just it's it's not free, um, but it is on the roadmap to add external IPv6 so that if I'm on you know, something like an IPv6 only ISP, I can still use Nebula and Handshake with other things. Today, you cannot do that, right? So that that is definitely an area we want to improve. Um, and, and we could probably gl blame Google Cloud for that because I don't think they supported IPv6 until well after we, I'm just kidding. Um, they, but IPv6 uh, support externally facing is something that, that we think will be important. Um, cool, so here is, uh, Here's the the uh, that right. How is the clock on that so incorrect? Okay, good. I'm not one minute away from or four minutes away from being done. Somehow my iPhone thinks it's nine forty one. Um, all right. So if I connect Nebula, right, and and by the way, the Nebula app. Another thing to be aware of is it's pull to refresh. The reason for that is. If you're if you're dealing with stuff like tunnels, like you know, this, um, and they change underneath you while you're trying to debug something, it can be annoying. So we kind of decided that uh, you should pull to refresh. We might make that more apparent, but a lot of these screens, including like the active tunnels, these are all pull to refresh. So I've started up Nebula. Uh, here's the log file, and um, I'm not talking to anything yet. Like I have no tunnels. Why is that? Oh no, now I do have two tunnels. So by default, Nebula doesn't actually connect outbound to anything, right? And the reason for that is simply battery life. So it just does a, a just-in-time connection, including to the lighthouse. Um, and let me ping, let me ping. This is my own personal Nebula network. So 2.168. 
Um, and I think you'll see what Bruno asked about in a second. So I'm gonna ping that. So that first ping was a little slower, like an extra extra 180, whatever milliseconds. That was because that, that ICMP packet was cached. And then if I go back here and look at tunnels, this is the one that I just did the handshake with. Um, you can see that cache packets is now zero, but for a period of time, it, it was much more. Nate did a great job on this mobile app, by the way. Like there's, the, the mobile app is, is certainly more user-friendly than, uh, than the uh, uh, command line version. That's something we're working to improve with Nebula, we're going to, you know, have proper proper applications that you can run. Uh, right now, it's it's command line only. Um, but what's what's cool about the mobile app is too, like I can look at stuff like the certificate on my phone and get all of that detail that I printed with Nebula Cert, um, you know, right there, which is pretty cool. CA, you can add multiple CAs, so you can the thing I was talking about where you can trust multiples. That's great. And then um, one thing to call out in relation to what I was just showing you is this lighthouse interval. So the way nodes report themselves to lighthouse in non, on non-mobile devices is you set this to something like 60 seconds. And then every 60 seconds, your, uh, your computers, your servers, whatever, they'll look at their local interface list and they'll tell the, uh, the lighthouse about everything they have. That's how they can discover sort of local IPs. Um, with, the, with a phone, we made the decision to set this to zero by default, which means the phone doesn't even reach out to the lighthouse uh, when you start Nebula. So when you click connect on the mobile app, other than starting the Nebula process, nothing happens. And the reason for that is, um, is simply that it's, it's a much more rare use case outside of testing that you are trying to connect to a mobile device. Like usually you're doing outbound from a mobile device. And so, the reason that's the reason for this uh, lighthouse interval being set to zero. But if you do have the need to connect to uh, two mobile devices like an iPad or an iPhone, and you know, and and you want them to uh, um, to be reachable even if they haven't tried to talk to something else on Nebula, you can you can just change this this interval. You know, you can make it sixty seconds or six hundred seconds, and it'll start self-reporting to the lighthouse, and and then this phone would be reachable from wherever. So just a, just a handy thing to know about. Um, let's see, you can, you can set the listen port ex explicitly. You can set the MTU, uh, Cypher, log verbosity. And then this is kind of cool. You can actually see the rendered configuration. So um, this is much like what, what I showed you on that host. One, one major difference is you can't see, um, I'll use my mouse here. This, this, the key is hidden. It's actually stored uh, within the keychain on the device. So uh, the workflow is slightly different. And I'm gonna try, I only have 10 minutes. So I'm gonna try and as a last step here, I'm gonna try and stand up a fresh Nebula network and we'll see how this goes. Cause that is, that is gonna be a bit of a challenge. Okay, so I'm new site, let's call it test. And basically what I'm doing here is I'm just gonna stand up a new Nebula network that uh, can talk to all those AWS hosts I just launched. So on my phone, and I just realized it's blocked there. Now you can see it. So uh, all I've done so far is type test, certificate, generate keys. So this is a, this is a public key. Um, I'm gonna share it uh, with signal. Oops, I'm gonna share it there. And, and the reason I'm doing this, by the way, is just to, uh, I think I shared it to the wrong place. That's fine. Um, the reason I'm doing that is just because I have signal running on my, on my computer. And so that way I can, uh, I can pull up the, uh, the public key on the computer for the next step. All right, so I've copied that, that public key. Now, you can't see this, but it's off to the side right now. All right, so here's this window. There's the public key from the phone. Um, and, and by the way, the reason this, this flow happens is right now we don't allow you to put a public key on a phone. Like we, we kind of said, you know, they have, they, they can be used as a bit more trustworthy devices. So you can't generate a private key off of the phone and put it onto the phone right now onto a mobile device in general. All right. So I've got that public key now, uh, I'm on my lighthouse and I'm going to do, uh, phone dot pub. Yep, yeah, did the right thing. And 
now I'm going to sign a certificate for that phone. So what I'm going to do here is Nebula cert uh, sign, and I the the help in here is is pretty pretty uh, pretty good. So dash in dash pub. So this is this is what's different to the documentation you'll find on the GitHub site. Uh, on the GitHub site, it's about how to generate keys without this sort of uh, intermediary step where you where you sign it off host and, and never expose the private key. But this is actually the way you should run Nebula in general. Um, so sign dash in pub, uh, oops, what was it called? Phone.key and then uh, dash name, phone dot my phone, whatever, uh, dash IP 100.64.0.100 slash 24. Sure, that looks good to me. It's not though. Oh, <laughs> um, dash ca cert is, and it, it has default uh, names for um, certificates, but the files are named something different. So define that root dot cert dash ca minus key, define that. And by the way, like these aren't the real company root cert and key. So like we're not, we're not that silly. Um, there. All right. All right. So phone dot pub and then phone dot search. So cat phone dot. Let me open a new terminal. Cat uh, phone, my phone dot search. Of course. There we go. All right. So what I've done now is use the CA that signed all of the, the keys. Uh, used on all of the other devices, and uh, um, I've created, I've generated a device cert that I now can send back to that device. So I'm just going to actually highlight highlight this cert. Go back to you can't see this. That's fine. Going back to Signal, I'm going to message it to myself, and then uh, in oops in Signal. Uh, I'm in the, bring this back up. I'm in note to self. So there you go. So there's the cert that I generated off host. Um, and then I paste the contents in here. I hope I'm not boring the heck out of everyone. Um, but there's that. All right, load certificate. So now I have this, there's my asserted IP validity. It's valid for over a hundred years. Again, don't ever do that, please. Um, need to share the CA. And again, the CA uh, that I used here, uh, I think was dynamic. So, um, so like these, these aren't, you know, these aren't long lived for any useful, any useful purpose. Like you, they, they'll cease to be useful uh, as soon as I stop these instances. So setting myself the root cert, you can load it as like a file, you can do a number of things, but I'm, I just find it easy to use signal and Cut and paste. So there we go. Oh, we're getting right up to the time limit. Are right. We... Yeah. I just wanted to let you know we've got five minutes left. And also, I'm hearing from people chat is not working. So could okay. everyone just type something into chat just to make sure that it, if that, um, if it's at a attendee. Okay. Cool. Seems to be going. All right. So anyway. Cool. Um, and by the way, like the uh, Slack HQ's Nebula repo has a link to our, uh, um, sorry, go to GitHub, uh, look at the Nebula repo and hop into the Nebula OSS uh, Slack group. And I'm happy to, to have more discussions offline after. So um, yeah, let me see. So let me go here and do this. And the next step is I'm gonna go here. Of course, I waited till the last minute and gave myself 10 minutes to do this. Uh, 100.64.0.1 is the lighthouse. So I'm turning on is a lighthouse. Um, the public IP is 18.191.126.2. And it's on port 4242. Save, save, and I think that's it. It's going to work. What do you think? I'm nervous. I mean, that doesn't mean anything, right? I already told you. So um, 
All right, so let's watch this terminal here and I'll do a uh, quick ping. And we'll do 100.64.0.1, go. Yay, cool. So, uh, so I just actually connected my phone to, um, to that Nebula network. And uh, yeah, it's just now a member of the network, which is, which is, uh, which is super fun. Um, one, other, one other cool feature I'm gonna show off real quick is I'm gonna swipe down here and I'm just gonna turn off my Wi-Fi network. And you're gonna see that it just, uh, it just roamed, right? So this is another nice feature. It missed a couple of ping packets, but like the, the idea here is I just turned off, well, that was weird. I turned it off and the icon's still there and my bar says 941, so thanks Apple. Um, but I promise you the Wi-Fi did turn off because it roamed to uh, an AT&T IP. And then if I go back and turn my Wi-Fi on, it will eventually, yeah, there it is. It roamed right back to the other IP. So there you go. Um, I'm really happy that demo actually worked out despite my best efforts to self-sabotage. And uh, let me just hop back over to this. Um, did all that in the terminal. So recap, let's summarize 90 minutes in two seconds, two minutes. Um, I don't think Nebula could have been born outside of Slack. The TLDR on this is uh, we did years of experimentation to, to make it this good and let it run it at the scale it does. Um, it would have been hard to convince anyone to give us money to work on this. Uh, and, and, but as a result, like it's, it is truly production ready. Like it is, it's not just used for like between regions individual hosts at Slack that might be sitting next to each other, or even running on the same hypervisor, they use Nebula to talk to each other. Like it is the fabric of the entire network. Um, the future, IPv6, all kinds of stuff, gonna just breeze right past this. That is the repo. Uh, go check out github.com slack HQ Nebula. Uh, go add a star to it. That's, that's always a nice thing to do. Um, and, uh, and come work with us. So we transitioned to doing Nebula full-time in February of this year. We are an entirely remote team, and uh, and we have some job openings. And you know we're we're excited to make networking that is that is much easier to use while being secure and performant and all the things we love. So uh, thank you, thank you everyone that that attended, and and uh, I hope that 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 wasn't too haphazard. Uh, come on by again. You know, check out uh, check out that link uh, Slack HQ slash Nebula. I didn't type. Yeah, I did type. Uh, and, and there's a there's a link to the Slack discussion group where you can ask more questions. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am I'm all done.